Hey guys, uh, I'm Ryan. Uh, I do a little business called Please. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe what we do exactly, but we're essentially a kind of underground pop-up restaurant that has been roving around town for the last few years. Uh, I have a few disclaimers before I kind of get into my story. Uh, this is my first time ever public speaking, so uh, please excuse the nerves and the stuttering. Um, secondly, after nearly a decade in professional kitchens, uh, I have no censor for bad language. Uh, so <laughs> this has the potential probably to be the most vulgar of creative mornings, and I'm sorry, uh, but I just they, I don't even hear them anymore. So. Um, um, and I also want to thank Jeremy for not making me cater this morning. Um, <laughs> that was a huge, huge plus to doing this. Um, so when Jer Jeremy gave me the topic of Rebel, oh, also I kind of hate using these as much as possible, so I don't have a PowerPoint slide presentation this morning because I, as you'll soon hear, I have a former life as a graphic designer, and I kind of vowed never to use PowerPoint uh, ever again. Uh, so I have a few visuals later on, but uh, for the most part, I'm just going to talk today. Um, so I kind of laughed when Jeremy gave me the topic of rebel. I don't really look, as, look at myself as a rebel, nor what we do. Uh, we kind of just, um, I don't really like to shake things up. I just kind of like to do what I do uh, and be surrounded by people who appreciate it, but not really kind of make any waves. Um, so my path to food and to back to Cincinnati uh, is kind of an untraditional path. There's no food school, or there's no uh, culinary school. There's nothing like that. Um, at an early age in my preteens, kind of early teens, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Uh, Crohn's disease is a uh, digestive disease. Um, it's all sorts of inflammation, and if you're really interested, I can talk to you personally or you can look it up. Um, but essentially, um, it affects your stomach and your intestines. Um, so I struggled with it through high school, um, and then, but it was, it was okay. Um, graduated from a small town, uh, worked my way to get out of there, uh, went to UC uh, at the DAP program for graphic design, um, spent five years fighting with Gordon Salco. Um, and then it's my second year and my sophomore year in college when I had kind of moved out of the dorms, I had gotten, I got really, really sick, the sickest I had ever been. Uh, my doctor's first reaction was to put me on a uh, gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, alcohol-free diet. And as a 19-year-old, that was kind of my, my, my diet. I lived on beer, I lived on bagels, and I lived on pizza. So um, I took it really seriously because this was my health, and um, I had to learn how to cook from scratch. So I learned how to make things like salad dressings, um, which I never knew that you could make. You just kind of bought those at the store. Because um, I had grown up in, in, in a small town, and without much of a, I didn't live a culinary enlightened. I had tater tots and fish sticks and hot dogs and mac and cheese like most kind of middle American kids did growing up. Um, so I learned how to cook from scratch and found uh, a passion in it. I, I continued to cook uh, any time I had free time from school. Uh, I learned to make my own tofu. Uh, I spent a portion of my time at, in college being a vegetarian. Uh, and just, it, I fell in love with it. And uh, I found myself pushing homework aside more and more to, f to, to read through cookbooks and uh, experiment at home. Um, so after graduation, I worked for my uncle in an ad firm in Cleveland, spending my days, weeks, and months laying out texts for annual report after annual report uh, in Quark Express, which uh, a decade ago, uh, which a decade ago was still a dated program. Um, <laughs> So I spent my days like opening Quark Express and taking five minutes for it to open. Uh, I pictured my next 40 years as a designer, um, half blind and plagued with carpal tunnel, analyzing line break after line break of annual reports. Um, I knew I had to get out. Uh, I needed to get back to those moments in design school uh, in foundations. I wanted to stand up while I worked. I wanted to sweat and I wanted to cut my hands with X-Acto blades again. And I wanted to have something physical and tangible at the end of the day to show for my work. Uh, I wanted to be tired when I left work and not just because I looked at the entire internet all day. Um, 
<laughs> so the answer was clear. Uh, I needed to get into a professional kitchen. Um, so luckily, annual report jobs usually pay pretty well, at least for a, uh, someone who had just graduated. So I saved up a bunch of money and waited for a job opening on Craigslist for a chef that I had respected in town. Uh, eventually, one opened up at a little uh, French bistro called Tartine. It's on the west side of Cleveland. I walked in. Um, the chef said, well, I walked in with zero professional experience with some, you know, minimal, well, I, I was a sandwich artist when I was 16, if you count that as <laughs> professional cooking experience. And I also worked a fryer slash dishwasher for a, a year in, in high school at a shitty little fryer joint. Um, <laughs> So the chef said, uh, I'll give you a couple days. If things work out, um, you can stay. And if things don't, you'll have to move on. Uh, s after those few days, I ended up spending two years working with Nolan um, and learning the basics of kind of French cooking. Uh, he, was, he would never let me refer to him as chef, which is a thing that will happen through the rest of my culinary career and stuck with me. Um, after two years at Tartine, I moved to Pittsburgh to be on the opening team of a restaurant called Salt of the Earth. Um, for those who may be familiar or may have heard Kevin, the chef there's name, uh, he recently just broke the record for the highest funded restaurant in Kickstarter history uh, for his, his project in Braddock. He just left Salt of the Earth to open a community-based restaurant in Braddock, Pennsylvania, uh, and he raised over $300,000 on Kickstarter to make it happen, which is kind of amazing. Um, so after a few months at Salt of the Earth, I got really, really sick again, um, really sick. So after years with a doctor who put surgery as the last option, uh, it was time for me to actually have surgery. So I had most of my colon removed and spent a year recovering at my parents' house. Um, and that's when I started Please. Um, I launched Please in Cleveland uh, a year later, having no idea what I was doing. Uh, I fucked up a lot. I served a lot of shitty food. Uh, but I was cooking and I was figuring it out. Um, and it was a way for me to manage my own time, my own hours, and my own stress, things that I couldn't do in other people's restaurants. Um, excuse me. While continuing to be way over my head with Please, um, I continued to cook around the country in short stints, learning and learning more as I could. Uh, it took me from everywhere from avant-garde cooking in rural Virginia to a food truck in LA serving heavy metal hamburgers, and all the way back around. Um, when I got home, so I was spending a period of my life kind of being a nomad in the fact that I could, as a cook, I could pick up and work for a few weeks or a few months in any city and then move on. Um, so when I arrived home, I decided, um, I decided that I always had fun when I revisited Cincinnati, Cincinnati after graduating. And I figured I'd go back for a summer, see what was going on, cook my way through the summer, and then move on. Um, so that was three years ago. I came to Cincinnati with no intentions of staying and was taken aback by how much it had changed in my absence. Fork Heart Knife was commending two hour waits for brunch uh, and a chef named Dan Wright had just opened a place called Senate. Um, to me, seeing the early developments of a new food scene here in town uh, was really exciting, but I had no idea how my food would go over, let alone did I know what exactly my food was at that point. Um, so we started doing dinners in the Bright neighborhood uh, in what is now the Brush Factory's workshop studio. Um, I begged friends to fill seats I couldn't fill with paying diners, um, which didn't work all the time still. Uh, free food wasn't even enough of a motive. Um, somehow a writer from Edible Ohio Valley uh, ended up at one of our dinners. Uh, they wrote a short little piece in their next issue and from then on we were on a roll. It was a slow roll, but we were on a roll. Uh, there was less of begging friends uh, to fill free seats at that point. Um, after outgrowing that space uh, and deciding that I was going to stay in Cincinnati, I got an apartment on uh, Milton Street um, and began hosting dinners more regularly out of my home. And that was uh, about two years ago. Um, and that's where this takes place. Before this starts too much, I must warn, uh, this is full of really bad language. Uh, I d again, when picking songs, I didn't even hear it. So consider this my rebellion against the iTunification of all videos. So. <laughs>
So that was uh, almost two years ago. After that, we took up residence at Street Pops last winter uh, while they were closed over the winter, uh, crammed into their tiny little space, and did dinners out of there. Uh, from there, last summer, last spring, summer, and fall, we spent um, our time cooking outside at Carriage House Farm in North Bend uh, with no electricity, no water, uh, and we cooked over th everything over a wood fire grill and a wood fire oven, uh, which probably deserves a whole separate speech. Uh, on the logistical nightmare and the absolute blast uh, it was cooking without any infrastructure and completely at the mercy of the weather. Um, I have another video showing that, I think. Yes. And this is our very first dinner at the farm. So lastly, guys, we've taken up a uh, home at Palette 23 in Northside uh, this winter, serving eight, eight guests at a time at a chef's counter, uh, just inches from where we are, uh, cooking the food and plating right in front of everybody. Um, so that kind of brings us to now and how I arrived here, kind of untraditionally. Um, so now I guess I will get into the rebellion part, um, <laughs> which I still think is funny. Um, so the type of rebellion I'm going to talk about is uh, more of a rebellion against yourself than, uh, to me, rebellion isn't so much about uh, me or us versus them, because uh, I'm sure most people in this room at some point have had an idea or venture that many or 
one person has told them that wouldn't work. So that's not the path I'm going to go around, go down. Because in re reality, I think you will be your biggest road, roadblock, not your naysayers. Um, so my first, my first topic is to rebel against waiting. Uh, in researching these talks, uh, I came across Chris Glass's talk, which was amazing. Um, and he talked about don't wait. Uh, I couldn't agree any more. Um, you never know what tomorrow brings, whether it's a health issue or just a major life curveball. You'll never be perfectly ready. You'll never be perfectly prepared. You, again, will fuck up a lot. Um, but those early clients, whether they're diners or you know, freelance clients or whatever, uh, some you'll never see again, and some will become your best clients that will stick with you for the rest of your time. Um, secondly, talk about um, rebelling against staying too comfortable. Um, this is something I do on a daily basis, and that means changing things. As you've seen, we've, we change formats, we change locations, and we change menus uh, often, weekly, if not sometimes daily. Uh, it's easy for any of us to have that great creative idea and kind of uh, roll with it and just let, it, let that be our defining moment. Um, but for me in the kitchen, complacency is the enemy. It burns out cooks, it burns out chefs, and it burns out customers. Uh, there's nothing worse than having a favorite restaurant and visiting whether it's every other week or every three, three months or six months and it being the same menu when you want to go in and have a completely great new experience and meal. Um, let's see. Um, and we rebel against the fear of failure. Um, when you're in a creative environment, um, the last thing you have to do is you should do is, is worry about failure. Um, some of our best dishes and best ideas have come out of failures from other dishes. Uh, our pop-ups, I would say, whether it's dishes or meals, uh, have been huge failures at times, but they're learning experiences for us and uh, they create uh, valuable takeaways, I think. Uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, something a little more specific towards me, the re rebellion against the idea of the chef. Um, the idea of the chef, the all kind of knowing creator of food and uh, dining experiences, um, notoriously known for physical and verbal outbursts uh, that are sometimes often rationalized with, if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. Uh, somehow physical and verbal abuse is still somehow seen as okay in the food industry. Uh, it's even romanticized to a degree um, as a spectacle. Uh, we tune into Gordon Ramsay to watch him verbally dress down cooks. Uh, we, we associate it with a well-run kitchen. If the chef's yelling, it means he really cares, which I think is a misguided idea of passion. So uh, in my ch kitchens, I choose not to yell, and it seems silly, but that uh, to me is a huge rebellion. Uh, I choose to work hard and quietly and respect the cooks around me. Uh, it creates an enjoyable environment, one that's motivated by hard work and creativity, uh, not one of fear and stress. Um, I surround myself with smart people, most of them probably smarter than myself. Um, I never stop learning. Uh, anytime I have a chance, I travel to go cook in other people's restaurants. Um, and I'm open to ideas wherever they come from, whether it's the sous chef or the dishwasher. Um, our dishwasher has had some great ideas. Um, so I think if you can focus on the rebellion of, uh, uh, against yourself and not towards the concerns or the detractions of others, um, to me that's where the interesting work happens. Uh, you can kind of strip away, uh, through these things I feel like you strip away the, the minutia and the, the extra, the excess, and you really find out um, what's important to you and um, what guides your work. And then to me, after all that, you can kind of stick to your guns. Um, which I guess could be rebellious against others, depending on where the outcome is. But for us, that's opening a brick and mortar restaurant. Uh, that's paying our employees a respectable wage. That's giving our employees health coverage. That's giving our employees days off. And that's giving myself days off. These seem like pretty standard ideas, uh, but in the food industry, these are all pretty foreign concepts. Um, uh, there are plenty more kind of aspirations we have, but I won't get into listing them. Um, I hope this gave some insight into what we do, how we do it, and how we got there, and how we use rebellion against our kind of our own ideas um, to push ourselves forward. Uh, I hope something. I hope somewhere out of all of it, you can take something away from it. Uh, thank you for your time and being interested in listening to what I had to say today. Thanks.
Uh, Jeremy said I could just go into the Q&A if anybody has, has any questions, but I don't know if there are many. Where did you get the name, please? Uh, that, was a, that was probably the hardest part of getting started, was the struggling over the idea of the name. Um, I don't know, a few friends and I had kind of just sat around and pitched ideas. It has, you know, multiple connotations, but all that sort of apply for food, whether you're asking please for something or if you're pleasing people through food. Um, so it was, it was food related without being like a direct word that comes from food. One more time. Uh, so March is our last. Our last dinner is at Palette Twenty Three, uh, and then we are officially done with our regularly scheduled dinners. Um, I'm, we're going to do one-off dinners out of the farm throughout the spring and summer. Uh, but I'm taking the time to again this spring travel to Europe to go cook for a substantial amount of time, and then uh, I'm turning my focus into one instead of cooking dinners with all the great produce that's coming throughout the season is to start building a pantry, uh, making our own vinegars and preserves and so on and so on, uh, while we kind of actively pursue looking for uh, a permanent home. So that's what I, I've been doing for the last few months. Uh, I'm extremely picky, so I haven't quite found something yet. But uh, we're taking time off from the dinners so I can focus on getting that started so we can be more of a full-time thing. So, but in five years, hopefully that's in a, a year. Uh, five years, I have no idea. I, so hopefully still here in Cincinnati, hopefully still cooking food. So. How many people do you have on your team? Uh, I am the only f kind of full-time employee. I shop, I source, I shop, I prep, everything myself. Um, at service, Susie, who's back here, is kind of our front of house person if we have such a thing when you're sitting a counter right in front of you. Um, a dishwasher, and then usually two other cooks. Uh, Briner is also here as kind of our intern. Um, so anywhere from three to five people uh, at the actual dinners. But otherwise, it's, it's me putting in hours and hours of work. I think I work more now. I started please so I could manage my hours and, and my stress, but I think I work more now owning my own business than I ever did working Hotline. So, yes? I see that you use you know, some exotic ingredients, or at least you know, the person growing up Right. Uh, what, what kind of things really excite you? What's, what's new on the horizon that you're looking to like to integrate with your team? Uh, well, our focus is, is, is about kind of extreme seasonality to sometimes to a fault. Uh, I don't like putting things on my menu that aren't actually in season. So um, that means like when raspberries come around, it's usually two or three weeks. It's not a whole summer or half the year. Um, so seasonality and, and, and what's local, again, is a huge thing. We work with tons of local farms. So whatever is growing at the moment is kind of what is our inspiration. Um, spring's right around the corner. So we're, again, we're talking rhubarb and asparagus and morels and ramps, which are like a wild onion. Um, you know, all those green kind of pungent, funky things are hopefully a, a month or so away. So did that, is that, did that answer your question? Sure. I mean, and then. The exotic ingredients, I'm assuming you're meaning like flowers and things like that. Uh, that, had, that just came from working with chefs and seeing the gardens and, and some of the chefs that I work for, or some of the farmers and seeing their gardens and some of the chefs I had worked for. Um, the only real link to kind of real food that I had growing up was my mom was an avid gardener and I didn't know at the time that was something that interested me, but it's, that seems to be the link back instead of saying I had a grandma that I used to bake with or something like that, you know. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's often just walking through the garden at Carriage House or another farm and picking things and tasting things and going from there. So, yes? Is there a kind of a, is it difficult to kind of find this balance between, you know, the constant change that's, you know, part of your work uh -huh. and then also uh, craft, like, like trying to That's my biggest struggle. Dish. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, there's change is part of it. Yeah, right. Has there ever been a dish where you felt, man, if, if the season could go longer, you know, I can do, do a few more iterations. Of totally, and there's things that we reapproach a year later. I mean, there's ideally, like I said, with building our pantry, we'll be able to extend the season of things. Uh, right now, I just don't have a permanent space, so we, I, my girlfriend is very um, helpful in letting me store lots of things in the house. But I think there's, <laughs> we're, we, I think we're past the brink of what of how many things I can bring and store in the house. So um, yes, I mean, refinement into dishes is a thing I struggle with a lot because we don't want to change just for change sake. Things still have to be, the core of the, everything for us has to be delicious. Uh, whether it's interesting or whether it's creative, it still has to taste good at the end. 
Um, and that's something I learned on my journey. It wasn't necessarily always the first, the first motivator. Um, I think as we look for a brick and mortar, obviously, you're, you're, we want to stay as creative and as changing, but the reality of changing every day is, is not so much. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think for people who've come to our dinners on a regular basis, they see dishes pop up maybe once or twice a year that are the same kind of concept, but we, I keep kind of messing with them. And, you know, so, I don't know. That's, that's, that's the biggest thing I struggle with is how we continue to refine dishes while keeping up with the season that changes every week. So. That, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'll say this too. Um, looking at your video, it looks like you spent years, you know, getting them just right. So uh, you know, you well, it <laughs> look like you're reinventing the wheel all the time. It looks like you got it down. Cool. Well, thanks, Beth. Um, I was just curious what you usually eat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, luckily, I, I don't work every day with these. Or I, you know, we, I, we have lots of very active on time and then lots of very active downtime like any kind of freelance job. So in the downtime, I try and cook at home for me and my girlfriend, uh, usually as much of a one pot meal as possible. Um, for me, that's almost impossible to do. Um, lots of fish. I've been inspired by my girlfriend to try and eat less meat. Um, and I think that's something that's influencing my food. It's trying to be more vegetable focused and more um, conscious of just how much meat consume. But then again, we're in a Midwest city, so it's, it's been a balance of finding uh, those things. Uh, I'm a sucker for pizza and cheeseburgers still. I mean, I haven't outgrown my, my, my upbringing, so I will jump at the chance to eat some cheeseburgers or some Skyline uh, at any time. But at home, we try and cook a grain. I try and eat gluten-free as much as possible at home um, and as vegetable heavy as possible and as quickly as possible. <laughs> yes? Uh, I think of dishes in color a lot uh, when creating new, new ideas for dishes. Um, that plays a huge role. I would say color more than composition plays a huge, absolute huge role in what we do um, and, and, and inspiration. Uh, composition is something uh, I fight with. I, I kind of hated the grid system in, in, in college. So I kind of like an organic, I don't like, you know, there are a lot of chefs who do like the very perfect squares or circles of things, like meat in a perfect square, which is just weird to me. So we try and keep shapes really organic, uh, but still composed and not messy. And that's, a, again, a, a tough balance when you're trying to refine things of finding composition that's organic, say like, uh, I was always inspired by like Raygun Magazine as a design element, which kind of broke all the rules, but still somehow had the rules. Um, so I like organic composition still using the same palette or the same toolbox. Um, but yes, I think of dishes and colors a lot, and that usually kind of, that can create dishes on its own. And we've done dinners that are Roy G. Biv dinners, where we, uh, each course is a, is a single color, um, progressing through the color scale, which is always fun and kind of harkens back to my design past, so, yes. Um, I was curious, because you talked about kind of being self-taught, like, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And when you're kind of building your own pantry, trying to do your own dressings, how much of that is pure experimentation and how much are you trying to draw from kind of an existing template or research uh, as a kind of a starting point? Uh, I don't know, maybe 50-50. I mean, there's, there, in building a pantry or doing these dinners, I feel like if, if, if three or four of the five or six dishes work, then we're successful. Um, can you repeat your question again? I'm sorry. Put, put, I, I realize, like, put a better way, maybe, is what's the process sort of when you're developing a new, say, a new dressing or a new... Gotcha. Um, uh, it's all product-driven, again, and seasonal. Um, so it's, it's not saying, like, oh, this dish needs to have this dressing. It's what, what ingredients are available right now to me that make sense within the context of that dish. So it's not saying, you know, we want to serve, I don't know, pumpkins in spring or something like that. So, um, I don't, know, I don't know if that answered your question at all. <laughs> yes? When you're cooking out in the wilderness and you're cooking over open fire and everything, how do you handle keeping a sink or kind of like a water source? Uh, we have one of those big football igloo coolers uh, that we wash our hands under a lot and pull water from. Um, and then we have the big kind of square jugs from, of, <laughs> of 
filtered water from Kroger or whatever. Um, the dishwashing part is probably the biggest logistical challenge. Uh, our kind of on-staff dishwasher kind of pre-cleans everything. Um, so um, he wipes everything down. Uh, at least last year at the farm, we did two nights in a row. So we would have to wipe everything down, uh, repack it, bring it back to the city, uh, wash it, repack it, and then bring it back the next day, which doesn't sound that bad when it's like one plate, but it's over the course of you know almost 15 diners for six courses, you start doing the math, and then all the pots and pans. Uh, there were many hours after the farm that were spent just washing dishes. Uh, so that was the biggest challenge. That's why we're probably only doing one night in a row there this year. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, you just, it's, any, like anything we do, it, it's all about having a, I live on lists and pre-planning and being organized. I don't know that the rest of my life is that way. But when it comes to working, it's just making sure you have backups of everything and are completely prepared for the amount of water you may need and how many times you're going to have to wash your hands and so on. Yes, Doug. What's your perception of the local dining scene? Is there a strong sense of rebellion or is it stuck in places? Uh, I think it's, a, it's probably a kind of a, 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 a fight right now. I think, I think compared from what it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago when it was a really old school French kind of approach, it's, it's changed dramatically. Uh, I think some chefs are still kind of, whether they want to be rebellious or want to do something, they're, they're still a little a little hesitant to pull the trigger all the way and kind of teeter the line between safe and a little bit rebellious. Um, but I think there are plenty of chefs that are, do I mean, the fact that Quan Hapa serves uh, balut I think is way weirder than anything. We uh, sometimes get the rap of being serving weird food, which I think is kind of ridiculous, but um, the fact that they serve balut, which is like a chicken and an egg, is crazy. Like that's the weirdest thing, That's I don't think it gets weirder than that. So. Um, <laughs> I think it's cool that there are chefs doing stuff like that. There are chefs starting to do some of the like non-prime meats and doing, I mean, Jose's doing a lot of vegetable stuff over at Salazar. Uh, Dan does some amazing stuff over at Abigail Street, I think. Um, Julia Nectar is like the local queen. She's like the OG local foods girl. Uh, and Bokeh, too, are doing some really cool local stuff. Um, about Whether it comes to pushing the envelope, some chefs are starting to do that a little bit. I think Nick at Hand of the Woods is doing some really cool local focus stuff, but some really interesting new technique. Um, but yeah, I think the food scene this year is, is exciting. I'm excited to see where it goes this year. There are a lot of kind of chefs out in free agency that uh, may do their own thing, Nick being one of them, and seeing how Jose settles in uh, at Salazar, because he has a resume that blows anybody's resume in town out of the water. Um, and, and Dave from La Post is kind of floating around right now. So it'd be interesting to see if these guys kind of all find homes for their own visions instead of working in other people's restaurants and seeing where that goes. But I'm excited. I mean, I, I think it's really cool where the food scene's it's changed, even from the three years when Senate was the, the lone island down on Vine Street. Um, but I also think it's good to have balance. I, I, I don't think a food scene exists at all like kind of fancy high-end restaurants. You need the Bakersfields and the Quan Hapas and the, all those, too. Those are the places I eat probably more often than I go eat fancy meals. So. <coughs> I hate celery. I still hate celery. <laughs> I just, I won't put it in a stock. I won't eat it. I just hate celery. Um, there are a few ingredients I've had to learn to love, and uh, some of them I've come full, full circle and, and absolutely adore, uh, mushrooms being one of them. Um, but yeah, celery is just like the, the, the most disgusting ingredient in the world. <laughs> it makes, it, it serves no purpose. It's, <laughs> you, when you cook it, it's bitter. When you eat it, it's stringy and gross. It's just, it's, yeah, yeah, so. yes. That, that I've ever done? Yeah. Uh, What's the question? If I have a one-time favorite dish that I've done, uh, I don't think there's a, there's like a single, there are dishes that I don't, I don't, couldn't probably specifically tell you, but um, there are dishes where I, I, as I played with them and as they went out, I was like, the, some, something in, in my skill level just changed. Like, it seems, re it's really weird to be able to, to physically see that. Uh, there have been dinners where I was just like, something happened between last month and this month. Like, it just happened, you know what I mean? So, uh, there are dishes along the way that I'm really proud of just seeing that progress. Um, but I don't know what they were. I couldn't tell you specifically what they were. Mm -hmm.
Yes? Uh, what was the menu at the last dinner? Um, they change so often. I'm so focused on our dinners this weekend, I, I have to take a second to think what we served last time. This weekend, uh, we have uh, so salt-baked kohlrabi. It's kind of like an all-cabbage dish with sauerkraut, um, cabbage that we cook with some mussels, um, and some dill, uh, then a chicken dish that we marinate in buttermilk with lots of onion and lots of bay leaf. It goes with a buttermilk and onion puree, uh, some pickled chanterelles and uh, egg yolk sauce. Um, some pork that comes from this really awesome farm in West Virginia that kind of finishes their pigs out in the mountains, kind of like wild. So they're half board breeds, so they're, they root around for mushrooms and acorns and it gives this kind of amazing flavor to it. Uh, so we're doing that with uh, sunchokes that we've kind of marinated in yogurt for almost a month. Uh, some malt and some, um, some black trumpet mushrooms. Uh, and then dessert we're doing um, sorghum with creme fraiche and white mulberries. And we are also doing, I should know this because I have to go work on this after this. Uh, <laughs> What is the other dessert? Um, oh, smoked celery root with butterscotch and apples is the second. So we do two desserts at all our dinners. That's kind of a, a, not a shtick, but a thing that every time someone sits down, we say, this is your first dessert for the night. People's faces light up. Uh, <laughs> so we've stuck with it. So we do three savory courses. So our format now is we do three savory courses and two sweet courses. So. Ryan, can yes. I share uh, one of the menu items at the dinner that I was at? Sure. Okay, so it was the menu was just basically words like flowers was the first course, and it was flowers, edible flowers on top of cucumbers with like a ranch dressing. So that was it was just a, a few words for each course. But my favorite was, if I can remember this, it said this was like the main course: S spent grains, the beer it made, and the. I'm spent grains, the pig who ate it, and the beer it made, or something like yeah. that. That, that kind of that could harken back to one of the dishes that I thought was really cool. So one of the local pig raisers here uh, feeds their pigs the grain from Mad Tree. Uh, so we took that pork, uh, and then we took spent grains from Mad Tree, and then we took the beer and kind of made this kind of life cycle dish of grain and pig. Uh, that was really cool, yeah. So. While I was eating that dish, the people who raised the pig were sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have lots of farmers at our dinners, so. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, it, it changes in each format, but yeah, right now we do two weekends a month, uh, two nights out of those weekends, and then we do two turns per night, so. How do you, it seems like it, when you're only open for business that often, mm -hmm. it seems like it'd be really critical to have a full table in order to yeah. be able to do it the next week. Oh yeah, I mean like, one. Uh, we've kind of created a cancellation policy that's a little extreme, but is, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, because literally one person miss, not showing up or not paying is, it, we, we make everybody prepay too, so uh, there's no like, are they going to show up? So we kind of have the money whether they do or not, um, because one person not showing up is, it can sometimes be the, the difference between us breaking even or making money or us taking a loss in such a small format. Um, but I don't know that, that there's any sort of other regulation other than uh, it's, I spend lots of, I spend just as much time kind of working the reservations because I do that myself too and trying to find, and, and knowing some regulars that whether they, they're more flexible or whether they like to eat alone that can kind of fill that, that awkward, that single spot sometimes or however we do it or beg friends. I still beg friends at, at times to fill seats and give them, you know, a, a discount to show up or something, so. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's a, just a really rigorous ca cancellation model and prepay, is that's how we kind of... Sell out really quickly though. <laughs> yeah. I do, yeah, that's another thing is, is the, obviously with four nights there's more demand than there is supply. So we have an email list of uh, about 2,000 people for, um, what is it, 10, 40, 80 seats a, a month. Um, so yeah, they usually go within in 10 minutes or an hour, 10 minutes to an hour. So you're contacting the people on that list pretty regularly, like 
we send an email out once a month from our email list, and that's the way we kind of announce. Um, and then it's first come, first serve. Yes? Or do I what? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, right now. I don't forage anything because it's, it's crazy cold out. But um, <laughs> and and nothing's growing. Uh, uh, but it's a mix. Uh, spring is it? Spring is spring. Is, the, the in between seasons are the big foraging seasons. So spring and fall are the great times to get outside and just walk through the woods. And it's a good excuse to get outside too. Um, so you'll find more of the forage stuff through in the spring and, and fall, and then more of the kind of like vegetable-driven garden stuff in the summer. Yes. Have you run into any trouble with health inspections or city regulations? Uh, we did when we first started, uh, but we have been in constant contact with them. So there's a, a little rule that if you serve under 13 people at a time, uh, you don't have to be health inspected. So that's why we do dinners of 12 people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why we don't do 24 people, or why we don't do more more people a day. Uh, it's just because it's the little sweet spot we found that works for the health department and it works for us. So uh, I, I think we run our kitchen uh, as clean, if not cleaner, than any other. I mean, I, I come from professional kitchens, so it's not like things are sitting out unrefrigerated or, any, or you know, we're not working clean. Uh, but there have been, we've talked on the phone multiple times, they're happy as long as we keep it under that number, and I'm happy that I don't have to deal with the health department, so. <laughs> yes? Um, that's a good question. Um, there's sometimes I go into a, a, like planning a meal and I want to do a specific technique. Um, I think technique dr drives things more than maybe recipes for me. Um, so we'll find something that kind of fits into that that's also in season. Um, excuse me. But most of the time it's the ingredient driving the recipe or the technique. Anybody else? Yes? During your food education around restaurants in America, uh -huh. um, what is one of your worst experiences or one of your best experiences? <laughs> uh, my worst experience was last spring in, uh, in Europe. Uh, I worked at this Michelin star restaurant out uh, on the French border, but it was in Belgium, uh, who had a very old school French approach to things, and that was um, dressing you down in the middle of the kitchen for absolutely no reason. Uh, I. I would say, I usually am not a quitter. I, I left that stage early, or the stage is like an internship. Uh, I left that stage early because I, I just had too much personal belief in that that's not the way you run a kitchen. And after two weeks of uh, being called into the middle of the kitchen and for, for absolutely no reason and just spent five minutes spent uh, ripping me apart, uh, I decided it was time for me to come home. Uh, so that was my worst kitchen experience. Uh, my best kitchen experience was the weird avant-garde place in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. Uh, you'll also notice, or not notice, most of my training has been in the middle of places in the middle of nowhere that are doing interesting things. I think that for some reason that's just really interesting to me. Um, that's where I learned the no yell. I, I mean, I hadn't been in the kitchen with yelling, but that's where the chef who had won, uh, who later go on to win Food and Wine's Best New Chef for 2010, um, I had much respect for him walking into that, that position. Uh, he was the sous chef at um, Alinea when they first opened and had worked for Charlie Trotter before that as his sous chef. Um, he didn't yell, and he wouldn't let any of his cooks lose their temper or yell. Um, he called me chef, which I had no deserve, uh, I would, had no, I had, didn't deserve to be called chef in the presence of him, uh, but he called everybody chef, and everybody there had called each other chef. So everybody had this mutual respect for each other, and you worked hard, and you worked quietly, and respected each other. But he was also doing some, and to this day, the most creative and out there and inspiring food I'd ever seen. So for me, that was like that was a huge defining moment for me and and moving forward for my cooking career. Yes. So one of the really fun things about being um, a uh, at these dinners is you get a really cool group of people who are food adventurers, and so they go out and. Um, they're going to eat whatever you put in front of them, right. which sometimes people don't even know what's in front of them. What's been one of the things that uh, has been a kind of crazier dish that you thought people might not understand or get, but they just ate it up? Like, I know the beef fat ice cream was one of them. 
Yeah, we recently did like a Kentucky grass-fed beef fat ice cream, which I thought was going to freak everybody out, and it ended up being like, like, first of all, everyone was like, yes, I can't wait for this, which I thought was crazy. And then everyone really, really loved it. So I thought, you know, I feel like the more I try, I do something that I think is going to freak people out, the more receptive people are to it, which is weird. Um, <laughs> Um, so the beef fat ice cream I thought was going to be a weird thing, but people loved it. Um, I know it sounds, it, I know me saying that isn't convincing, but um, uh, sweet breads are a thing I feel like we do often that people are afraid of, but uh, when they have them, they're really good. They end up kind of being like chicken nuggets. If, if, if I'm going to again put my background into it, they just kind of taste like chicken nuggets, which is cool. Um, yeah, any, anytime you get into like the Oregon stuff, it's which I think is, gets a little weird to begin with. People get a little freaked out. But can be receptive if you, if you do it well. I mean, a good chicken liver mousse is really, really awesome. But um, there's some really bad ones, too. But, um, fit, still, people are weird about seafood and fish still a little bit sometimes, too. And I think they're surprised that monkfish tastes good or mussels taste good or whatever. Oyster, oysters are people are always a little, a, a little fearful of. So. Yes? Okay. I was wondering if you've ever been to the um, Spice Bazaar in Istanbul, Turkey. I have not. You have not. And um, second question was, have you seen um, spices as an element in your cooking, and whether they have importance or they don't? I don't use a lot of spice in my cooking. It's something that just recently I've, I've taken into, I've been thinking about a lot. Um, But I don't know, I, I guess most of the chefs I've worked for haven't really, don't really use a lot of spice, and I guess that's maybe a thing in, in kind of more modern cooking, but I've been reconsidering why that is. Um, I think a big part of it for me, too, is, has been trying to, to work with the farmers to get the stuff locally. To, I mean, with doing it so local, like, spices come from who knows where, and a lot of them grow in the gardens in your backyards. Um, so again, that's, that's been a goal of mine this, this, this year is in, in pantry building is to start discovering some spices that are local and um, that make sense on the plate. I mean, not that they're not delicious, but to me, what I want to do is, is somehow represent, whether it's the Ohio River Valley or Cincinnati or uh, Midwest. Um, so some of the flavors, I mean, sumac, I think, is some, a spice that we use a lot. It grows wild around here like crazy. Uh, and I think it's really awesome and, and undiscovered by people that live in the area, unless you're used to eating kind of Turkish food or Middle Eastern food that uses it a lot. Um, so sumac is probably the spice locally that I'm most excited about. Um, but yes, I think spice is something I'm, it's, one, it's like my new kind of exploration thing for this year. So, yes? I recently moved here and it's really interesting to me that Cincinnati is sort of at this crossroads of seven food ways and Midwestern food ways. Right. Uh, I, I don't try. I try not to take too much southern inspiration because, while well, if you cross the river, you're technically in the south. Uh, it, I mean, sorghum is something we use. I think that's an interesting ingredient, and we do source a lot of our protein, beef, and stuff from Kentucky. Um, but to me, it's. It, I think there's something more interesting about the German heritage here, or the, the Eastern European heritage, and just more thinking towards Appalachia. Uh, towards the east a little bit than it is for the south. I mean, we have a lot of farmers who bring stuff to us that are more towards Athens, which starts really getting to Appalachia. Um, I think the, the food history and the culinary story there hasn't been as explored or done as the as south has, uh, and is 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 something that that's that's kind of my focus and hopes where the food goes more kind of telling the story of the again the Ohio River Valley or the Appalachian Mountain sort of thing. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, in the winter, it's tough because there's no local produce. But I would say every other time of the year, just again, a walk through the garden or a walk through the woods uh, it finds me new inspiration. But it may just be going out uh, to eat and having a dish. And it's not so much the idea of that whole dish, but it may be a puree or a sauce or a spice or uh, something that strikes a memory. Um, I don't know. For me, inspiration comes from all over the place. It comes from color. Uh, a lot. Um, it comes. I, I have plenty of those moments where I wake up in the middle of the night and write something down and it makes no sense. Uh, we did a dessert, dessert last month that I will admit was cold medicine induced. I woke up in the middle, in the middle of the night after taking some cold medicine and wrote down these things and made a dish and it was. I thought it was pretty awesome. But uh, <laughs> um, so inspiration for me comes. I, I, we don't. I don't limit where it comes from. So. Yes. Like they 
a lot of times when you would maybe hide downstairs for cooking, how did you overcome that fear of getting out in front of people and like now you're doing such an excellent job speaking? Uh, yeah, I, I used to have to have like a beer before I came up and introduced myself at a table of 10. So uh, I don't know. I think it just kind of comes with the territory. It, it's like a sink or swim sort of, th or, you know, fight or flight. It's like it's just part of my job. And now at, at the counter, it's like people are even closer than they are here. Um, uh, but I think that that personal touch is kind of what makes our dinner special too. The, that fact that the chef isn't off hidden somewhere and he's this kind of special figure. It's like, you know, you can see me washing dishes and you can see me cooking the food and plating the food. And I like to interact with it. It's something I've grown into liking. I mean, I like, as, as Beth said, our, our menus are really vague just because when I print them, there's often the chance they'll change uh, substantially, even in a few hours between then and dinner. Uh, so we keep them vague on purpose. Um, so, but me, myself and my cooks, we source things locally and, and, and spend a lot of time doing that. And so we like to talk if people are interested, we like to talk about it. So uh, when you talk about something you're passionate about, it makes it a little easier to kind of face your public speaking fears or your, you know that sort of thing. So, yes. Do you ask your diners for feedback, or do they give you feedback after meals, and then do you incorporate that feedback into future meals? I do. I mean, I I don't know that I ask everyone. There were some of our regulars who are comfortable being open. With, I mean, not every diner you can ask them. Hey, how was everything? And you know. They may say, oh, I like this and I like this, or everything was pretty good, or really good, or whatever. Um, there are a few regular diners who've been with us since the, the shitty times uh, who, I tr who, I, who have no problem being completely honest and open with me. Uh, so um, we take into consideration, I mean, the diner is the one that's most important. So we take into consideration their critique. Because uh, in this small format, uh, and, and with it only being two nights a weekend or four nights a month, uh, I don't. I don't ever taste the dishes fully composed, and that's not like a brag thing. It's just a budget thing. Uh, we work on such a tight budget to begin with. Uh, we, I don't have the opportunity to sit down, make everything once, sit down and taste it, scrap it, and then a week later, buy it all again, uh, cook it, plate it, and serve it. So uh, I taste everything, obviously, component-wise and as I'm going. Uh, so feedback from diners at this point is pretty critical or cri pretty crucial and helpful. Uh, hopefully, with the brick and mortar, I'll actually have some time to sit down and eat everything before it's served. Um, but it's, it's mostly based on intuition and, and diner feedback is a huge part. So.